Hi everybody, I'm Marin. Welcome to the BA Test Kitchen. Today we are making gourmet microbe culture. Ah, how many times can I use that intro when I'm filming my kitchen before it gets old? Oh, I've had too much coffee today. Okay. Ooh. So we've been hearing a ton about viruses lately because of this whole global pandemic thing, and viruses are a kind of microbe. And not all viruses are bad, even though some, like the virus that causes COVID-19, can make us really, really sick. And there are a lot of viruses out there that have nothing to do with human health at all. There are also all kinds of other microbes out there in the world and inside our bodies, like fungi, parasites, and my personal favorite, bacteria. The coolest thing about all of these microbes, in my opinion, is that they make up so much of our world and so much of our bodies. And there are lots of them that we actually could not live without. Like they help protect us from infection by bad microbes. They help us digest our food. They help us develop a super strong immune system, just to mention a few of their really important jobs. The human microbiome, as it's called, has also become a really important field of study so that we can figure out how they play into the rest of our health because all of the microbes that live inside us are actually personalized to us. Like your microbiome is pretty much totally unique to someone else's, kind of like a fingerprint. So seeing as microbes are so important to our everyday lives, I thought it might be kind of fun to go to some locations around my house or to some common things that I use a ton and see if we can grow any of these common household bacteria and then look at them and study them and see if we can identify them and figure out if they're friend, foe, or if they're just kind of tagging along for the ride. I don't think you guys understand how exciting this is. This is like the coolest thing that I've ever done. And that's not just quarantine talking. I think this is maybe the coolest thing I've ever done, at least on YouTube. I'm so excited, we're doing my crew. To start us off, we're gonna jump right in with what the heck is in these plates. These are just standard plastic Petri dishes filled with a material called agar. Some people pronounce it agar, which is essentially a jelly-like material that provides yummy, yummy food that microbes like to eat, plus a comfy place for them to grow. Today, we are working with a couple of specialized kinds of agar. This first one is called an LB plate, and lots of stuff should love to grow on and eat from this. It'll probably grow the widest variety of our household microbes, and it's actually pretty easy to make at home and then pour into empty sterilized petri dishes, but I bought mine online to save me a little bit of time. Next up is our McConkie agar. It's specially formulated with two specific ingredients that will actually stop certain kinds of bacteria from growing. And this will help us narrow down our candidates when we're trying to identify which colonies are growing on here. And our last one is super exciting. It's a kind of plate that has an antibacterial in the agar so that it will only grow fungal samples so that hopefully we can isolate all of our fungi friends from our bacteria. Okay, awesome. Let's get testing, shall we? So other things you're gonna need in addition to your culture plates are swabs. I would not recommend using just your typical cotton swab that you can find at the grocery store or the drugstore because they are not packaged in a sterile way, right? So those cotton tips that you might get um, in the beauty supply section are not sterile. They may be contaminated with other stuff and you don't want that when you're culturing microbes because what if what ends up growing on your plate is actually from the tip of the cotton bud and not from the place that you're sampling. You don't want to introduce any of those unknowns. So you want to get sterile cotton swabs. And I want to emphasize that these are not the cotton swabs that are in short supply for COVID testing right now. Um, those swabs are actually really unique. Their um, stem has to be plastic and flexible so that they can reach all the way back there. Um, these are really rigid and they're wooden. Uh, as you can imagine, that would be very uncomfortable in your nasopharyngeal cavity. No, thank you. But also interestingly, as I said, these are cotton tipped, right? This bud is made out of cotton. Cotton, as we know, is a plant, right? So it was a once living organism, which means it has its own genetic material. What people are testing for when they sample your nasopharyngeal cavity for COVID is they're gonna take that sample and they're gonna genetically sequence it to see if there's any viral genetic material, viral RNA in that sample. Um, and if you used a cotton bud, some of that cotton's genetic material could maybe mess up your sample. So a swab that's actually used in medical settings for disease testing, if you're gonna do any genetic sequencing off of that sample, actually needs to have a tip that's made out of synthetic material and not cotton. 
Fun fact, the more you know. You're also gonna need gloves. Something else you're gonna need is purified water. Now, I just got this water from my refrigerator. If I were really doing this right, I would be using bottled water, and in the lab, we use really specially purified water so that there's no contamination coming from either the water or the container the water is in. But I don't buy bottled water to have at home, so this is kind of the best I can get. If you can't find organic, sun-ripened, grass-fed water, store-bought is fine. We're working with what we have. Why do we need water, you ask? Great question. We're actually going to pre-moisten our cotton tips. We wanna moisten our swab for a couple of reasons. One is that if the microbes are existing in anything that's been dried or kind of desiccated on that surface, then the moistened bud will help kind of suck up those microbes and help us get them onto our plate. Also, as we know, water makes things expand. So when our cotton bud is moistened, it gets a little bit bigger. There's a little bit more space in between all of those cotton fibers for live active microbes to get nice and cushy and cuddly in there as opposed to kind of being squished down by a hard, dry bud. So that's just a couple of reasons why we wanna pre-moisten our bud before we swap. Oh, very first thing though, absolutely number one most important ever for any lab work, what are we gonna do? Drink some more coffee. No, we're gonna put our hair back. <laughs> if you have long hair, you wanna make sure that your hair is out of the way. I'm just gonna put mine in a ponytail here. That's for two purposes. One, so that your hair doesn't contaminate any of your samples, and two, so that you don't get any of your samples in your hair. Neither of those things are good. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna actually sample is my hands. Uh, obviously, we talk a lot about hand washing during this pandemic time, and I think it would be really fun to swab our hands, culture that on a plate, and then wash our hands, culture again. Oh my God, I totally forgot literally the most important thing you will ever need for this. A Sharpie. <laughs> you literally cannot do this experiment without it because we're gonna use this to label our plates. Remember, the only difference between science and goofing around is that you write stuff down. <laughs> I'm gonna open these tips. We're gonna open from the bottom here so that they stay sterile. Is that a nice ASMR moment? Crinkle time. All right, I'm gonna take one of my buds. I'm gonna lightly dip it to moisten it. Now I'm gonna take this, our first plate, our first LB plate, remember that broth plate. Take the top off and you want to make sure that you do not touch the inside of the top of the plate with anything. I'm gonna take the flat side of my swab and not hard, but like firmly swipe it along my palm. And then I'm gonna roll the bud to the other side and get all up in here. And then I'm gonna take my plate and roll this nice and gently all over my agar. Ahem. So listen, I didn't leave an empty space on my plates as a control. If I were doing this really right, I would have left half or maybe a quarter of that plate empty where I hadn't swabbed it so that I could see if anything grew there, it was likely to have been a contaminant from outside my plate and not from my sample. So that would allow me to, when looking at my results, say if I saw that organism elsewhere in my plate, think maybe it could be likely that it's a contaminant and include that in my analysis of my results and take that into consideration when identifying which microbes came from the sample versus which microbes maybe didn't. Alternatively, I could have also done this by leaving three empty plates of each of the different kinds of agar in my incubator with the rest of my plates to see if anything grew on them. Those would be control plates, that's another way to do it. So even though that was a mistake that would definitely require me to redo the experiment if I were doing it for a lab or if I were gonna write it up, I think it's a really fun example of the fact that science is basically built on making mistakes. It's this idea of, oh, hey, this isn't working or, oh, hey, this may have messed our results up. Okay, what can we change? What kind of problem solving and critical thinking can we do to change the experiment and then do it again and see what we get and compare? I feel like it's kind of the opposite of, oh, you got it wrong, you did a bad thing, you're in trouble. It's like, oh man, we got it wrong, we learned something, and now we can move forward and be even better next time with more knowledge. That's the way I like to think about science. Okay, carry on. You're gonna be able to see where your bud has touched the agar, so that's good. You don't really wanna like go over and over on the same spot, because you want to spread those bacteria out. I'm talking onto my plate, I don't wanna do that, I don't wanna 
breathe or spit onto my plate. And you don't wanna break the surface of that agar either. So it's pretty easy to press hard and um, kind of like break the surface of it like you would with Jello. But you don't wanna do that. You just wanna like lightly roll or, or scrape. But I like to roll because I, um, covered you know all of the sides of my cotton swab with stuff and then we have a nice textured plate now i'm going to put this swab directly in the trash so that we don't get it confused and use this again because this one's used we do not want to use it again next most important thing is we put that top back on without again touching the inside as much as you can and we're going to label it very clearly now this is a little counterintuitive, but that top that we just put on is actually how we're gonna store it. So that's gonna be on the bottom. The plate is gonna sit like this because we don't want any condensation that forms on the inside of that top. We don't want any of that to interfere with the way our bacteria grow or which bacteria grow. So we're gonna store them agar side up. And I'm gonna label this with today's date and time uh, just to be super precise. What I sampled, so my left hand pre-wash and where I'm gonna store it. What's today's date? I could definitely be neater about this, but this is what we got. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the other two kinds of agar that I have, using a new swab every time for each one and labeling each one immediately after I'm done. Let's go. Okay, that's my left hand after it's been unwashed. So now I'm gonna wash my hand and then we'll do it all over again. The stuff that makes our hands dirty actually mixes with the oils on our skin to stick there. So to get rid of them, we need something that removes oil. Now, if you've ever tried to mix oil and water, you know that they don't mix well. And that's because water is a polar molecule. Oil is nonpolar, which means that there's no way for that water and oil to interact just as they are. So you gotta bring in so its molecules have polar heads and non-polar tails, kind of the best of both worlds. Its tails are attracted to that oil encased dirt while its heads are able to interact with polar water molecules. So it forms these nice bubbles. That's what we call micelles around most things we'd want to get rid of. Then when you wash away the dirt with running water, the water takes those micelles and the dirtiness those micelles are surrounding. All right, and here we go. I usually like to go in the same order that I went the first time, just because it makes me feel nice. Helps me not get lost in the sauce. Ooh, this is exciting. Okay, so kimchi is a probiotic food, uh, which means that it has active live cultures in it, kind of like yogurt or um, kefir, if you're familiar with that. I'm a little worried about this one because this one is definitely past its sell-by date. It might explode, actually. Ooh. Oh, look at this. Can you see those bubbles? Like right there, right there. Oh my gosh. And like when I opened it, all of the cabbage like rose to the top. Again, I will not be eating this. I will definitely be having to trash this after we sample. Oh my God, but they are active. We are gonna get something good out of this. I'm not gonna wet my cotton bud here because our sample is very, very wet. Just a nice, nice dunk in there. I'm gonna sort of like, scrape along the cabbage too to see see how much we can get here. Excellent. So the other two sampling locations that we're gonna do uh, that I think are gonna gross us all out a ton are my cell phone, both before and after sanitizing. I'm gonna, just gonna use a Clorox wipe and then my shower floor, which I'm not gonna show you because I don't want anybody to see my bathroom. So there. All right, I'm doing the whole front of my phone and then the side buttons. I feel like that's gonna get us, well, I guess I lay it down on its back a lot. So let's do the back, I guess. Okay, now I'm gonna go do my shower and you guys are not invited. And uh, I'll be back and we'll talk about why and how and where we're going to incubate them. Now that we've sampled, and plated, we're gonna need to incubate our samples. This is keeping them in an environment where their growth will be optimal. So anything lower than 75 degrees Fahrenheit, our bacteria are probably gonna grow too slowly. They may not die, but we may not see them in colonies like we would be able to see with our naked eye as fast as we would want them to uh, at any temperature lower than 75 degrees Fahrenheit. At any temperature above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, our bacteria are probably gonna die. Um, 
they may not be able to withstand temperatures that high, at least the ones that we are probably gonna be growing on these plates. So we're gonna want to build a makeshift incubator that we've monitored to make sure that it is staying at that temperature and hopefully fluctuating as little as possible. This is my recipe for a slapped together at home incubator. One empty clear plastic box to contain your samples and that you can see inside to monitor them as they grow. One clamp on desk lamp with a bulb that is safe to leave on for several days at a time. One indoor outdoor thermometer for monitoring the temperature of your incubator. Alternatively, you can also purchase a heat lamp, especially if you're keeping your microbes in a cool place. But as it's summer here currently and I don't have AC, the heat lamp actually took my incubator over the 100 degree threshold and I just didn't want my microbes to fry. So I just used my desk lamp instead to try and even out that temperature variation while still keeping it under the 100 degree threshold. And lastly, you'll need one clean, little used corner of your house to store your incubator. Ideally, this will be out of direct sunlight and not near a window or a door to keep the temperature as stable as possible. Here I have some plates for an entirely different experiment and I just pop them in my box, pop the lamp and the thermometer on top, turn my lamp on, and voila. Okay, so today is actually day three post plating. Excuse me, I just did my workout and I didn't uh, check in with you guys uh, in the first two days because nothing was happening, but the kimchi plates, are just like going insane, which is not surprising because that was obviously a swab from an active culture. So we knew that there was stuff in there, but I'm actually gonna take those kimchi plates out because I really wanna reduce the risk of any contamination. I don't want those bacteria to spread to any of our other plates and mess up our other plates. So I'm gonna take the kimchi plates out and you guys will be able to see how nuts they're going. Ooh, look, there's some shower floor action happening. The phone ones are going crazy. The hand ones are growing. Oh my God, I'm so excited. All right, let's get this little kimchi one out here. Oh my God. Holy crap. Man, that's so cool. It's like a little furry mountain. Ooh, I know, I'm such a tease. I'm sorry, but subscribe to this channel so that you can catch that video when it comes out in just a few days so we can share the results of what actually grew and how we're gonna identify them and what we see under the microscope. I am so excited to share that video with you guys very, very soon. I'm not gonna make you wait very long, I promise. Put note here at the end that this video and the one that's coming soon, so subscribe to this channel, are sponsored by Samsung's Solve for Tomorrow competition. You can check out them and what they're all about at Sulfur Tomorrow on Instagram and Facebook or at samsung.com slash sulfur tomorrow. Also, I filmed this clip and many others in this video and the next one on my Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. So thanks, Samsung. Thank you guys so very much for watching. And as always, stay curious, have fun, and I'll see you next time.